Good evening, everybody. I think it's evening anyway. Um, thank you for joining us today for this Pest Extra presentation. Um, we're going to have some live Q&As later on as well. Um, we have got um, Dr. Jonathan Wade and Alex Wade from Wade Environmental talking to you today. A bit different. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, presentation about myth busting and the common pest management theories fact checked. And there's going to be a, a, a brilliant uh, footage and some video um, footage of some of the experiments they've carried out. Um, it's a lot of fun and really, really interesting. So I think you're going to have a, have a great time with this presentation. And at the end, um, Alex and, and Jonathan will be live to do some Q&As. So just to go through a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, in terms of CPD, hopefully everybody understands how the CPD works now. But just as a quick reminder, it's it's accumulated through all of the hours that you spend with us and the exhibitors. So when you're seeing the exhibitors, maybe watching videos and watching seminars, that's all added up at the end of your event time. And yeah, we give you one at one CPD point for each hour that you're active with us. Um, as I mentioned before, we've got a Q&A section after the um, video footage that we're going to going to share with you um, now. In terms of Q&A, there's a button there that says submit your questions. So use this for the questions to the presenter. We've also got a discussion uh, forum. So use this area to have, you know, general chat, general comments, maybe, you know, if you've got some, you know, um, nice comments to the presenters, I'll be happy to read those out if we have some time. But use the Q&A section just for your specific questions to the presenters at the end. Um, what you can also do if you see a question in that area that you think that's a brilliant question. I would love to hear the answer to that also. Um, then give it a thumbs up, give it a like, um, and then I'll be able to see uh, which questions have got the most thumbs up. And again, I'll make sure those ones get, get answered. Okay. Um, if you have any technical problems, sound or, or video, uh, you have a live support, an orange coloured live support button that you better click on to, to get some support if you have any technical issues. But hopefully we're all, we'll all be good. Um, and last thing, in the live sessions, we can't hear or see you, but if you do want to have some live chats and have some interaction with us and the exhibitors, then, you know, make sure you go to the specific stands. That would be great. The exhibitors are the ones that have made this happen for us. Um, you know, it's free for you guys to attend and they're the, they're the ones that have made this happen. So make sure you go and have a good chat to them. OK, great. Well, without further ado, yeah, let's, um, let's get Alex and Jonathan's video started and then we'll have some live Q&As at the end. to Pest Extra, this very unique online event. Hope you're all having fun and enjoying yourselves. Um, we're here today to talk to you about Mythbusters. We're gonna take some commonly held beliefs and we're gonna try and do some experiments for you to try and show how these are either incorrect or how, how they can benefit you guys. But first off, my name is Alex Wade and this is my father, Jonathan Wade. We are the directors of Wade Environmental. Uh, and Wade Environmental is a newly formed pest management consultancy, which is able to cover everything from field trials down to assistance with technical writing. Um, I myself, um, Alex Wade, I've been in the industry since I left university and I have managed a series of technical efficacy suites and laboratories over my time, which has given me a fantastic insight into the behavior of rats and mice and also how a lot of the chemicals that we use uh, day to day in our industry affect these animals and how they can be best put to use. Uh, and here we have my father, Jonathan, who's going to introduce himself. So. Hi there. Well, my name is uh, Jonathan Wade uh, and I've spent 40 years in the pest control industry, both in the UK and overseas. I've specialized in pesticide application management uh, and those are the topics with which I'd like to talk to you today. Excellent. So, yes, we're going to talk about some commonly held myths. So very quickly, I mean, myths, myths are fun. We've, we've all seen, you know, the real myth busters. And, you know, th there is an element of uh, enjoyability to myths, but there is also a very real issue with holding on to some of these preconceptions. Um, issues such as um, if, if we hold on to these myths, then it can detract from the value of the services that we give. So first off, we're going to have a look at um, compression sprayers with, with Joe. And I think, what's your piece called? My piece is called Machines That Sneeze. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So without further ado, let's have a look at some machines that sneeze. 
So our first myth is machines that sneeze. And we're going to have a look at here what the common misconception is, is when you get to your new sprayer or insecticidal applicator, all you have to do is unpack it, fill it up with water, put your chosen insecticide in, pump it up and, and off you go. But of course, this is this is wrong, isn't it? This is entirely wrong. Mm. Now, uh, most PCMOs have at least one type of compression sprayer in their toolkit. Um, it could be uh, a sprayer like this. Uh, this is a Hudson, in fact, but it could be a Chapin, it could be a B&G, it could be a Gloria. Uh, and other brands are, in fact, available. Um, if you don't use a big knapsack sprayer, it's perfectly acceptable to use a sprayer such as this. This is another compression sprayer. A few pounds from a garden centre works just as well. Necessarily, if you're treating a very small area, you could even use a, a trigger spray like this, which is, in fact, a similar sort of function. It uses compressed air to blow the pesticide through the nozzle. So whichever mechanism you choose, you first got to clean it because there could be manufacturing residues left in the sprayer and oils can be particularly damaging to some formulations. So first of all, clean it and then calibrate it. And this is a simple process where the sprayer is pumped up to its nominal recommended pressure, say four bar, 100 PSI, and the spray is discharged into a suitably large and calibrated container. Well, the amount of spray issued in one minute can then be measured. And the amount of spray uh, can change with temperature, it can change with the nozzle, uh, it can change with the nozzle wear. And different formulations, in fact, have different viscosities, and they can also alter the spray characteristics. So armed with this knowledge, you can estimate the amount of spray formulation that will be delivered to the target surface within this time. Now, why is this important? Well, because all manufacturers of pesticides spend thousands and thousands of pounds testing their products against a plethora of pests with the specific intention of establishing the correct surface deposit rate for the active material that's going to provide the necessary level of control, typically at least 90% for a specified time, particularly, say, three months. Now, the bottom line is, if you don't spray the correct amount of pesticide for your chosen pest, you will not achieve the level of control expected. Too little product sprayed, and it's not going to work. Poor short-term control. Too much product sprayed, well, that's just a total waste of money, and these things cost a lot. Pest repellents can occur, even at high doses, which gives you poor control. And there's also the chance of environmental contamination, uh, and you could have the wrath of God <laughs> falling your heads from CPD. So there are several other factors that can also influence the level of control achieved, and we'll discuss them next. Okay. Well, generally speaking, a compression sprayer uses the energy stored by compressed air to force the formulation through a nozzle, and this shatters the liquid stream into gazillions of droplets, some extremely small and some extremely large, and this is collectively called the spray. Now, as you continue to apply the formulation, the pressure in the sprayer falls quite quickly, and within minutes, the sprayer has fallen to only 50% of its original pressure, or we're delivering only 50% of the quantity of pesticide. Oops. Well, you're now underdosing the target surface with pesticide, and the control efficacy will have diminished. So, better pump the sprayer again and repeat the process. Now, this seesawing of the pressure generates a spray mosaic, initially areas of high pesticide deposit, slowly degrading to areas of low pesticide deposit until you have to repump, and then an area of high deposit, slowly degrading, etc., etc. This is not what you want for good pest control, because the issue is further complicated by the fact that as the pressure within the sprayer falls, then the force acting on the fluid formulation passing through the nozzle also falls with a direct result that the spectrum of droplet sizes that is produced also changes. At high pressure, the droplets are smaller and there are more of them. But as the pressure falls, then larger droplets are produced as the nozzle becomes inefficient. And these droplets can be up to 500 microns in size, half a millimeter in diameter. Now, such droplets fall to the floor in less than a third of a second when the spray nozzle's only about a meter from the floor. And wasting such a large droplet, in fact, 
many tens of thousands of them every few seconds of spraying, each of which may equate to over 250 useful droplets, just doesn't make good sense, or economy for that matter, it simply leads to a wet floor. But fortunately, there's an answer. The use of a spray management valve costing a few pounds can stabilise the output pressure no matter what the internal pressure of the tank. And this allows the compression sprayer to deliver the product at a constant pressure and a constant output rate, therefore allowing the PCMO to treat the surfaces with a stable and even spray deposit. Many compression sprayers, when you buy them, can be fitted with some form of pressure regulation, usually a device that limits the upper pressure that's produced at the spray nozzle. Well, that's all well and good, but it doesn't take account of what happens when the spray pressure falls, which can produce a lot of big droplets. Now, the way around this, as I mentioned, is to use a spray management valve. Um, these come in a variety of sizes. They're calibrated to certain pressures. There's a two bar one, there's a one bar one, uh, and each of these manages the upper and a lower pressure that's delivered to the nozzle and thereby stabilizing the flow output, stabilizing therefore the droplet spectrum and stabilizing the amount of product you apply to the surface. These are a few pounds and they will save you a fortune. Now some of these droplets will stick to the surface and be absorbed. Some may bounce off altogether and this is determined by the nature of the surface the impact speed, which is determined by the pressure in the sprayer, and the size of, and the nozzle construction, uh, and the formulation chemistry. And we're going to illustrate this by the use of some small play balls. Now here, this is going to represent one of the small droplets. Got a bigger one. Huh, you think that's big? I've got an even bigger one. <laughs> Here's the demonstration that we referred to before, and forgive the Heath Robinson or Blue Peter nature of this demo, but it's intended to show you how the different droplets produced in the broad spectrum of uh, spray deposit can impact on different surfaces. In the first instance, we have a shiny surface representing ceramics, enamel, porcelain, followed by an absorbent surface such as wallpaper, and followed finally by carpet. A carpet's commonly treated for flea control and other such things and you definitely do want your products to stick to that surface. So here's what happens when we look at some of the smaller particles produced by a compression sprayer. They don't stick. Now these particles typically are those that you might find in a fog. They're five microns in size of the maximum, typically one to five microns, and they're intended to infiltrate an area of space as a space treatment product to control flying insects and sometimes for the control of cockroaches in an enclosed volume such as a sewer. They're not intended to stick. They're intended as a surface contact product for the pest. And the re reason they work so well is they're paraffinic based. Surface tension is a third of that of water. It allows these particles to stick to the waxy cuticle of insect pests. The next size of droplet that we'll find definitely is going to be useful for our pest control system. It sticks to a whole variety of surfaces and in fact enough of these together will produce a chemical minefield that the crawling insect pest will have difficulty trying to penetrate. Sometimes when the particles are a little larger and have a different formulation chemistry Unfortunately, they don't stick and they can just roll straight off the board, straight off the surface, and they won't provide you with any realistic pest control whatsoever. However, a ball of a similar size, a droplet of a similar size, can actually work quite well if its formulation chemistry allows it to stick to the surface which we're trying to treat. They can stick to absorbent surfaces, they can stick to carpets, depending whether they're nylon or wool. Uh, Occasionally, you may get one that sticks to a ceramic surface, but quite rarely. If anything, they're going to coalesce and run off on the floor and be useless. Now, getting to a useful size of particle is quite difficult because the sprayer at high pressure will produce 
trillions of these very small particles, and you need enough of them to stick to make it work for residual control. So ideally, you want a particle size that's quite a lot bigger, that in itself can hit the surface, spread out, and leave a good, solid, controlled surface. Whoops, I can see that some of these don't stick very well at all. However, given the opportunity, if the formulation chemistry is again tuned to give a good absorbency on the surface, you'll find that these balls will actually stick quite well. Um, and in, in themselves, they provide a perfect control environment. A pest walking in one of these is going to die because there is enough chemical loading in a single droplet to actually provide a lethal dose for the insect pest. Whereas with the smaller droplets, it will need to contact quite a lot of them to do the same job. Now, when everything goes a bit wrong and your spray nozzle gets worn, or the pressure drops, or you don't have a management valve in place, what can happen is this. A huge droplet that doesn't do anything for anybody but fall on the floor and wet your shoes. Well, I have to say, I don't think I've had so much fun playing with so many balls uh, in all of my adult life. Um, but other than being just some good fun, uh, there were some real important points brought up in, in that demonstration, weren't there? Yes, I hope so. And I think it's important to realise that there are several other factors, in addition to tank pressure, that can affect the spray quality and the spray deposit rate. Uh, one of which can be interruption of flow. Um, and you can see here, I have a very large filter that's incorporated into some sprayers. Uh, conversely, in many of the more popular sprayers, this is the size of the filter that's used. It's tiny, and this can block very quickly, and this will affect the amount of spray coming through the nozzle. So, how do we get around this? We have different nozzles. Some, some are supplied by the manufacturer, and a typical one that's supplied by the manufacturer is this tiny brass nozzle here. It's cheap, it's cheerful, uh, it does the job. But in actual fact, this will wear extremely quickly. So we have an option here. You could use a stainless steel nozzle. Uh, this will last quite a long time. Um, it's very cheap also, and it's the first thing you should try and put into your spray when you buy it, is a proper nozzle. And if you want to be really clever, you can use a ceramic nozzle. Now, a ceramic nozzle, uh, will not wear for years, uh, and so it's a huge economy. You can just swap one of these out, uh, and then all the problems of nozzle wear and attrition go away. So, what can we do about the wear in the nozzle? They do wear, generally speaking, and unless you've fitted a ceramic or stainless steel one, the brass one that comes with the sprayer is going to wear out so quickly that after a few hours of spraying, it can change the spray pattern, it can change the spray delivery, and it can change so many things. It can block, it can get clogged up, it can get crusted with deposits, and they're generally not a good plan. Now, these gummy deposits uh, should be cleaned off, but when you clean your nozzle, you've got to make sure you don't use a, a steel pin or a wire brush, because this is, in fact, going to make matters even worse. So, how close are we going to use our sprayer? This is another, fa another important factor in applying the correct amount of spray deposit. If you hold the nozzle too far away, the inverse square law applies. And for every doubling of the distance of the nozzle away from the target surface, you reduce the spray deposit by a factor of four. Now, this obviously is going to affect the length of control. So that's the thing you've got to bear in mind. You've got to learn how to hold the nozzle. You've got to learn how fast to move the nozzle in order to get the right spray deposit. So. When we reflect on the fact that during overseas vector control programs for things like malaria vectors, encephalitis, trypanosomiasis, or even just general peridomestic urban pest control, many of the spray operators undertake a week of daily training just to learn to use the compression sprayer, learning the rhythm of the spray lance movement, learning to walk the walk, so that chemical deposits are evenly and accurately applied. Now, these training programs are refreshed quite often. You know, here we are in a very sophisticated and technologically advanced environment. And how often do our spray operatives calibrate the sprayer, learn how to use the sprayer, and learn 
how to apply the spray by the correct movement of the lance at the correct speed and the correct distance from the spray surface. The inevitable end result is if you don't use your spray properly, this machine that sneezes, you'll get very poor pest control. That's, that's fascinating. Uh, thank you ever so much for that. And it, it's amazing to see all of these um, extra little bits. And uh, it, it's really um, amazing to see just how small a difference can have such a massive impact on, on a treatment. I mean, as you say there, even if you take into account uh, nozzle wear and if you take into account uh, your filtration, the fact that you are a little over six foot and I am for a considerably shorter, uh, if we were to do everything the same, we would still have this difference in spray application if we're not careful and mindful of how we even walk. For sure. And I think uh, there's a lot to be learned uh, just through going back to basics, learning how to use the sprayer. Um, because after all, the whole point of this is to avoid callbacks. The last thing you want to do is under spray uh, and actually get called back. It costs you money, it costs you time, it costs you another job. So start at the beginning, do the job properly, calibrate your sprayer and calibrate it often. Do a little calculation on a piece of paper, work out how much the manufacturer says you need to apply and make sure you apply that amount of product. Then you'll get the results that you expect. Perfect. And all we thought we had to do was unpack it, fill it with water and away you go. Clearly not. Excellent. And now it's time for Alex's myth, which is the colour of the bait or the colour of the bait box affects the way that rodents approach the bait, take the bait and accept the bait from the bait box. Yeah, yeah and that's, that is a, a myth I've heard many times and I'm sure uh, you guys may have done as well when people make these outlandish claims where um, they prefer the, the red one over the, the blue one or, or they go into the green boxes more often than they go into the black boxes. Uh, and this, al although there is, you know, a grain of, of truth to it, is actually largely a, a fallacy. Rodents are what we call dichromatic. They only have the ability to see two colours. Uh, we, on the other hand, are what we call trichromats, and we are able to see red, green and blue. Now, just to explain how weird eyes are, um, we actually can't see the colour yellow. So what happens when we perceive yellow is this is our brain creating that colour yellow. And, and this is fascinating. And if you imagine your rainbow uh, of all the, all the colours of that spectrum, You'll notice that red will sit at one end and blue will sit at the very far end. And what happens with our eyes is when we have our red receptors and our blue receptors firing simultaneously at the same amplitude, your brain says, well, if both of these are working, it must be because we are seeing a colour in the middle. And this is fascinating. It means that we have this ability as human beings to differentiate between many, many colours. However, rodents, as I said before, are dichromatic and they can only see in the blues and the greens, and they both sit at this end of the spectrum. So they don't have this ability to uh, infer colours across the rest of the spectrum. And it means that most of the colours that they see will either be muted tones of blues and greens, or simply just a perception in grayscale. And what I'm going to do in a minute is I'm, I'm going to disappear off to uh, Joe's basement, where it's a little bit darker than up here. And I'm going to show you with some of his coloured balls and a couple of flashlights, just what I mean by this loss of colour, this loss of perception, and why in reality, actually, rodents cannot tell the difference in colour between a red bait or a blue bait, and they can't tell the colour difference between a green box, a red box, or a black box. And so in reality, there is a different set of sensors, there's a different set of priorities which are engaging and motivating these animals, but it almost certainly is not their sense of sight. Just make sure you don't steal any of my tools when you're down there, please. <laughs> it's, it, is a, it is an absolute Aladdin's cave down there. It's amazing. Hi there. So I'm now in uh, Papa Wade's basement. As you can see, he has, uh, if he has a tool that B&Q doesn't own, it's because it hasn't yet been invented. Um, but the reason I've come down here is for this section of the experiment, I'm going to need some total darkness to be able to show you what I mean. Now, previously, I just mentioned to you that the human eye is a fantastic thing. We're able to see 
an entire spectrum of color because the cones within our eyes are able to bracket one end of the spectrum to the other, and then we can infer the data from the center of that spectrum. However, rodent eyes are completely different. They only have the cones from one end of the spectrum, the blue and the green. Now, to try and show you what impact this has on how they perceive the world, uh, of course, it's very difficult for me to somehow poke the cones out of your eyes. But what I can use is this specialist little torch here, which will only produce one color at a time. And using the balls from Joe's experiment, I can show you actually how colors will change or our perceptions of colors will change as we are removing different spectrums of light as we would be or as it would be for the rodents as they lose their different spectrums of light. So let me just reposition my camera here so you can see my board and then my assistant is going to turn the lights out on me. Oh, there we go. This isn't at all spooky. But if I turn the torch on, you can see here that under a full spectrum of light, all four of these balls appear different colors. But if we start to change and only use one spectrum of light at a time, suddenly those balls all lose their individuality. They are appearing to be just different shades of gray. And as we move through the spectrums, we can see that certain lights will actually have a little bit of a differentiation, but certainly other lights, you are losing differentiation between these balls entirely. And so this is exactly what is happening here with the rodent eye. Because they don't have this ability to have a full spectrum of color, and they are only able to see in blues and greens, suddenly you can see that the differentiation between the green box and the black box, or the red bait and the blue bait, suddenly becomes relatively meaningless. Because to a rodent's eye, actually all we are seeing, or all it is seeing, is different shades of gray, or the differentiation between different shades. Yeah, that's fascinating in actual fact. We're, we're favored with the fact we can see 16 million colors, so our computer screen tells us. <laughs> but what about other animals? It's known for sure that tigers, for example, are, are orange because their prey species can't see them. What in fact do other animals see? Well, yeah, so this is it. So rodents are being the pets that we've looked at mostly here. Uh, but rodents aren't the only pests that we deal with. Uh, and so if you take into account birds, and I'll show you in a minute um, how some bird feathers react under ultraviolet light, you can see that there's a huge spectrum of colors, unperceivable to us, but definitely perceivable to birds, which allow them to communicate with one another. And they also allow them to navigate their environments in a way that is completely alien to us. As well as birds, we also have a plethora of insects that are able to see in spectrums outside of our own. They can see very well into ultraviolet light. And if you ever have the opportunity to see a flower or um, a, a bush or a plant underneath UV light, you'll see that it looks completely different. And these are the drivers that move insects. And so to insects and to birds especially, Vision is a very important part of their decision-making process. It's also important to remember uh, with rodents, we're talking about seeing in dichromats. Um, another thing that most of us don't tend to realize is that rodents are seeing the world from an inch above floor level, whereas we see it uh, in our binocular vision from six feet above floor level. Everything is different. If you're a rat and you're wandering around an inch off the floor, then the world is a totally different place. Now I have here a range of feathers kindly donated to me for this experiment by my lovely uh, lab tech who collects such oddities and uh, wonderful novelties. Uh, and I wanted to show you these to show how actually on the flip side of what I was just saying, there are some animals which are highly visually motivated and they utilize parts of the visual spectrum which are completely unknown to us. And by that, I mean the ultraviolet part of uh, the spectrum. Now, what we're gonna do very quickly is you can see here that these, these feathers are a range of different colors. And just to quickly show you, if we put them under different colors of light, um, we again lose 
some of those vibrant hues. The yellows all disappear when we put it under blue light. Under green, we still, you know, we get some of the yellows, but we lose a lot of the reds and the oranges from the other end. And again, if we look at it under blue, red light even, it's a completely different spectrum. But what is really very interesting is if we were to have a look at this using an ultraviolet torch, such as this one here, that although the torch to us is appearing as it's reflected off the white surface as a blue light, you can see that these feathers are reacting in a completely different manner than, they are, you know, a standard blue light. And that's because these are absorbing the light from the ultraviolet spectrum and they are reflecting it back to us in a wavelength that we can see. Now, birds are able to do this in a much more efficient way, and they can take the small amount of UV light that we get from sunlight, and they're able to then perceive this reflected light um, much more clearly. So you can see here that with some animals, the, have, the presence of um, coloration is incredibly important to them. And you can see, in fact, here, just look at the tip of that one there, where it fluoresces under normal light, that is actually a black feather from end to end. And so these animals use this ultraviolet reflectance, they use the ultraviolet light as methods of communication with one another. And as I said before, if you were to take a flower and you were to do this same experiment, you were to shine regular white light at it, and then you were to shine a UV light over the top of it, you would see that flowers actually have a completely different reflectance. And that is because things like birds and things like insects, especially bees and ants, are highly motivated by light. And you can actually alter their behavior and their behavior patterns by using chemicals which reflect UV light in a certain way, or you can startle them by using different spectrums of wavelength and light. So some animals, yes, Light and reflectance means absolutely everything. Other animals, such as rats, it means very little to them at all. One of the myths I've come across over the years that is that there is a universal bait that rodents will accept under all circumstances. Now, for many years of working abroad and many years of working in the UK in pest management and also working for two different manufacturers of products, it's very clear to me that there isn't a universal bait and that rodents, in fact, will choose food with which they're familiar, food which services their particular energy requirements at the time, or food that services their requirements because of their physiological state, i.e. a pregnant female or dominant male. Uh, and it's clear to me, after all this observation, both in pen trials and the real world, that in fact, you need several different baits to achieve pest control under a wide variety of circumstances. Absolutely. And this is not just uh, opinion. This can be backed up scientifically. So one case study which was undertaken took a female rat who was weaning her babies and she had been fed exclusively up to this point on laboratory chowder. And when they put her into the cage and they offered her these two different presentations of lab chow and an enriched formulation of the same diet, she persisted in eating this uh, original chow that she had been conditioned to eat. Now that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is that this female rat was able to express proteins in her milk and in her urine that transferred this preference onto her offspring. And when the researchers took her offspring and they moved them into a separate cage uh, and presented the offspring which had up to this point only ever had their mother's milk and they presented them with the options then of the lab chow, the enriched chow, and then a completely new and alien chow that they'd never been used before. Those babies, when they took their first meal, they instantly and all exclusively went to the same feed that their mother had been feeding on previously. And this shows that rodents are not only able to make preferences for themselves, but they're able to pass these preferences on to other individuals within the population and to other generations within that population prior to them ever having experienced real food. And so the ability to be able to match food stuff to that animal's historical needs is incredibly important. Yes, we see it all the time. You know, the dominant male goes out, he finds some food, he marks it, he goes back to the 
the rest of the clan, uh, and they will follow along, follow his path to that same food. Uh, and these food preferences are transmitted up and down um, the hierarchy. So it's important as a pest controller to observe, to take note of what bait has been eaten at the time, to mimic it, and then you'll get better control. Uh, to mimic this properly, you will need to have several different baits available because at different times, different preferences are in place. So it's not very effective to say, oh, I always use cut wheat, cut wheat good for everything, because this is often not the case. You need to mix and match. Sometimes you'll use a wheat bait, sometimes you not, might need a flake bait, because you have to observe what the rodents in that environment are normally feeding on. So things like high protein and high fat pasta, excellent when the rats are needing a high energy input. At other times of year, when lots of other food is available, a diversity of food is available, then you have to mix and match again to try and copy what they're eating. And in that way, you can get better control. So never try to use one bait for everything because it's just not going to work. No, absolutely not. And as a final say within this, um, you also have to consider the environments that you're putting into, not just the rodents that you're presenting it with, um, but the environment itself can have a negative effect on how these baits are taken by rodents. Um, I mean, for example, you can use a, a pellet or a wheat based cereal or cereal based bait and usually expect it to have very good uptake. But if you're using it in an environment that's very damp or it's very um, warm or it has these negative environmental impacts on the bait, then it's going to detract from that animal's palatability and it's going to stop that animal eating that bait regardless. So in those instances, you need to be able to use a product that is going to be able to withstand the environment, potentially at a loss of palatability, but when compared to a spoiled bait, a wax block will always persevere. And so you need to maintain this range and this um, diversity of tools within your toolbox to match not just to the animals, but to the environments that you're using them in. Absolutely. So I, I think that just about finishes us off and covers our three major myths today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you all or talking at you all. Uh, we'll be around after this for a couple of Q&As, um, but looking forward to hearing all from you soon. Thank you very much. Been on mute. Bye from me. Bye bye. Hi there, Jonathan. Hi, Alex. Hi. Hi, guys. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Okay. Thank you. This is going to be. Uh... Oh, sorry. sorry. You're just going over the bloopers at the moment. Oh, oh can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Fabulous. Good stuff. Um, I've got a whole array of questions and lots of myth busting um questions to you so yeah this is going to put you right on the uh on the on the end of the of the pressure stick so let's see how we go so we've got some loads of votes for this spe spe specific i can say that word um so i'm often asked if it's true that if you have either mice or rats living in a particular area that you won't have the other living there at the same time is this accurate um no, yes and no. So I can answer this with, uh, can you hear me all right through the mask? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what I always say in these instances is um, rats and mice will share the same geography. They will, if you look down on a map, on a two-dimensional map, you can have rats and mice in the same building, let's say. However, they will very rarely share the same topography. So they will be at different levels if you were to look at that map in a three-dimensional aspect. So rats will try and exclude mice as best as possible um, and mice will try to avoid rats, but you can still find both species in the same square environment as looked at from above, but different positions within that three-dimensional object at that point. So they won't lap over necessarily, they'll just uh, keep themselves themselves, but they may be in a close proximity. Yes. Great, good stuff, fabulous. Okay, I'm gonna, this this question here, it's got a few technical terms in there, which just for the pleasure of everybody else there, I'll um, put them in a non-technical way, just so everybody can understand it, just in case. Um, but so the question is, regarding the cascade effect, um, I have always heard from the industry colleagues that um, the, the process of cockroaches eating the dead carcasses um, played a large role in secondary transmission. 
However, they've also heard that cockroaches will only resort to cannibalism after 21 days, and that actually the process of feeding on the droppings plays more of an important role in terms of that cascade effect. Which, can you set the record straight? Uh uh, I'm not. Have you done any work on cascades? No, I haven't. But I mean, I, I'm. Uh, I've read the same adverts that everybody else puts out in this particular uh, situation. And I think, with regard to cannibalism, if there's plenty of food available, then cockroaches will go for that that food. Um, when food is absent, then of course they may eat each other and may eat the feces of their of their partners. But um, I don't have any particular view on that. Yeah. yeah. No. I would say, yeah, the, um, the the driving factor between cannibalism is going to be um, the presence of available food. If available food stuff is very low, then cannibalism will happen almost instantaneously. If there's a lot of food available to them, then it is going to be not necessarily as a last resort, but as a, um, you know, a secondary option. So it will be a delayed response. So it reinforces that need to deal with that food source, you know, clear it up, get them to clear it away if they can and reduce it. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Great, good stuff. Um, okay, so can we please clarify that cockroaches do not spread if you stand on them? Uh, yes. So <laughs> having <laughs> having worked for years and years in the labs, um, I can say that this is not true. So the, the only grain of truth I can imagine comes from this is with species of cockroach such as Blatella, uh, Germanica, so the German cockroach, and they will carry their uothiki around behind them up until the very moment that that uothiki is ready to hatch. So of course, um, you can have a cockroach which may actually have offspring hatching from behind it, and it may be coincidental, but almost all cockroaches when they produce the uothiki um, will deposit it somewhere, either scatter it like uh, Orientals or stick it to something like the um, Americans. But no, treading on them won't initiate a hatching response. I think it's just more of a case of bad timing or yeah, good timing. Or you missed. Or you missed. Yeah. yeah. I, suppose the, the, I suppose, you know, thinking about it in a common sense way, if you're stepping on a new theca that's got nymphs in there still, then clearly it's not ready to, you know, open itself to the world. So they're not going to survive anyway, are they? No, no. I mean, the, the timing would have to be absolutely perfect for this to work realistically. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Great. Um, OK, so where can we buy the pressure regulators from? So rather than Mythbuster, someone asking where you can buy, or where you recommend maybe to get pressure regulators from. They've had a few bad experiences is all. Uh, well, I, I'm not going to pick a particular company, but they are available um, from many of the major suppliers. Um, Gloria manufacture their own particular one. The ones I demonstrated were manufactured by Lermark, which is an agricultural company. Um, and bear in mind that 99.9% .9 of all spray technology is agriculturally based. Um, so most of the, the nozzle systems and the spray management systems uh, and the pressure regulation systems are all available through agricultural outlets. Uh, it's just a case of doing a web search a lot of the time. Mm. Great. Yeah, good good answer. As you said, it's, you know, it's each person's individual choice. You've got to find the right one for you as well, haven't you? I mean, regarding nozzles, um, so do different formulations affect the life of a nozzle? Oh, categorically, absolutely. I mean, wettable powders uh, and some suspension concentrates are hugely aggressive to a, to a standard brass nozzle. Um, and the, the general rule would be that the shinier the nozzle material, the longer it's going to last because it actually deflects these sharp and spiky uh, particles. Now, some solvent-based systems can also affect polymer nozzles because they can cause them to soften to a degree. Mm. So you've really got to, I mean, it's it's not rocket science or, or break the bank to have a handful of nozzles. And sometimes if you're going to be really canny, you'd change the nozzle. It takes 10 seconds, uh, depending on the formulation that you're going to use. So yeah. it, it makes a lot of sense just to keep a few in your pocket. Yeah, it'd be great. I think a lot of um, pest controllers out there would, you know, probably like some sort of guide to, yeah, you know, if you're using this type of formulation, this is a good nozzle. And, you know, they'd probably, you know, really appreciate that. I, I tell you what, Joe and I will um, put our heads together and we'll put something up on the uh, Wade Environmental webpage <laughs> just precisely for that, if you want to check that out. Fabulous. Great. Good stuff. Um, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. We've been we've been given another couple of minutes, four or five minutes. So because you know we've got so many great questions, we want to get them get them on here. So tricky one. Do plug in sonar rodent deterrents actually work? Simple answer to that, isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> so uh, 
Okay. Oh, sorry, I was about to say, I can give you a good analogy for this, which is uh, imagine you're sat in your house and a car alarm goes off outside. Now, the first time that car alarm goes off, everybody will run to the windows, has a look out, has a bit of a peek, has a see mm. what's going on. Now, second time that car alarm goes off, half the people, half the people come and have a look and, and no more. By the time that car alarm's been making the same noise all night, absolutely nobody has the blindest bit of difference as to what's going on. And this is the same with the ultrasonic repellents. For a very short period of time, they will have an effect. And I'm talking, you know, that initial, it's like someone clapping their hands or making a loud noise. It will mm. startle those rodents. Mm. But because it's the same persistent noise and it's happening at regular intervals, it just becomes part of the background. Mm -hmm. And so these animals learn to just ignore it and, and move past it. Um, depending on how much time, there's a little bit about ultrasonic light, uh, ultras uh, ultrasound, mm. it bounces straight back as well. So um, imagine you have a plug-in on your wall here, uh, sorry, where are we? Here, and it basically shoots a, a, a cone of sound out. Now, because it's got a very short wavelength, it doesn't bend round objects very well. It ends up bouncing almost straight back. Mm. So if you've got it plugged into a wall socket in your home and you have tables and chairs and furniture, they're simply just going to ablate the noise. And so that rodent can simply avoid that noise mm -hmm. by just picking mm, another running, shadows, running yeah. in the shadows. Mm. So no, they're, they're, you know, it's a novel idea, but I would strongly recommend not using them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, the first time they come across it, oh yeah, it's not particularly pleasant, but they will they'll certainly get used to it quite easily if it was to carry on. Good stuff. Oh, have we got time for one more? Oh, uh, yeah, let me let me find another one, because I think that there's a lot coming in. So um, this might be. So is it true Henry VIII used to check for bed bugs by putting a pig in his bed first? I can actually answer this one. <laughs> yes, so Alex, well done. Oh, well, I do it. <laughs> OK. <you> do. <laughs> what? Um, so actually, this was a common practice um, all throughout um, the Tudor times when uh, it's sleep tight, you know, don't let the bed bugs bite. What a lot of people used to do, and this was actually mostly things like uh, publicans and inns where you had people moving in and through, is they used to leave um, dogs or pigs or other livestock in the room to satiate the bed bugs. So when the person came in to sleep, the bed bugs had all fed on the pig or the dog or the, you know, whatever sacrificial orphan you'd left in there. <laughs> and, you know, they they um, they left the paying guests alone. Yeah. So I'd say, yes, actually, it's probably a grain of truth yeah. to that. that makes uh, sense, doesn't it? Absolutely it does, yeah. makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Good stuff. Well, listen, that was, um, yeah, fantastic questions. There's a few more there. Just a quick note to the attendees. If there is anything, any questions on there that you really, really need those answers to, then please, you know, uh, pop a message over to BBC stand and we'll try and get them out to, to out to you guys and you can maybe give it a give it a go so yeah really appreciate it. that was amazing thank okay. you so much well, thanks, thanks for having me okay, okay. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye.